right, well, welcome everyone. Good evening. Um, it's wonderful to see you all here on the 1st of October. It's, it actually starts to feel a little bit like fall. It's a little bit chilly, huh? Um, my name is Patty. Uh, Patrice Chrysostomo, but please call me Patty. I'm a, a licensed child clinical psychologist um, and a program manager here in the clinical services division of the Children's Health Council. So it's so wonderful to be here with you today. I'm Virginia Peisch. Um, please call me Ginny or Virginia. Um, I am a doctoral intern here at the CHC, and I'm uh, conducting some assessments and then also doing individual psychotherapy with kids and teens. Yeah. Um, and so feel free to go ahead and get settled. Um, so we'll be with you today until about 8 o'clock. Um, our hope is to um, talk about uh, the process of psychoeducational evaluations. Um, so who here has been to CHC before? Who's familiar? All right. Welcome back. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, CHC, we are a community-based nonprofit organization. Um, we've been here for over 65 years. Um, we were founded by Esther B. Clark, um, who was the first female pediatrician in Palo Alto. Um, and here we work with youth and families to uh, learn how to learn, to develop grit and resilience to help youth realize their dreams, stop hurting, make friends, feel better, and of course, have a brighter future. Um, a little bit more about CHC, so this is our vision. So we truly believe in the promise and potential of every child, teen, and young adult, and our mission, um, all of our staff members here, um, really are trying hard, very hard, to uh, work to remove barriers to learning um, and to help our students uh, become resilient and happy um, and successful at home and in life in general. Um, and so what we here at CHC are really trying to do is remove social and emotional barriers um, to learning and mental health um, regardless of language, location, um, and ability to pay. So for those who are not familiar, um, CHC, we have our, our uh, home clinic here in Palo Alto, but we also have a clinic um, down in San Jose, and we just recently opened a location in Ravenswood in East Palo Alto. So it was a very, very exciting development in the last year. Um, so we, very much try to use a holistic approach to working and to working with and understanding a child. Um, so this means supporting the development of um, a student's academic skills, um, helping a student to learn the basic skills of how to learn, um, focusing and bolstering mental health and wellness um, by working with a particular student, but also the family system, um, and uh, supporting their physical development. And we, are, we really try to provide uh, holistic care um, for the whole child and their families, and we have experts um, here um, uh, in our Palo Alto locations, as well as our other locations, uh, representing multiple disciplines, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit. Um, so our areas of uh, expertise um, are um, uh, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, learning differences, anxiety and depression, as well as autism spectrum disorder. <coughs> We have uh, four divisions, uh, the clinical services division, uh, of which I'm uh, one of the program managers. Um, and within the clinical services division, we have um, a multidisciplinary team. So under the umbrella of mental health providers, we have uh, psychologists like myself, neuropsychologists, psychotherapists, um, psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners. Um, and then we also have uh, speech language pathologists, educational specialists, um, as well as occupational therapists. Um, part of the CHC family is also our community connections uh, division. Um, for And the community, I'll give a shout out to the community <laughs> connections division as they are the ones uh, who uh, put together these parent ed, these free parent ed classes, um, workshops for providers in the community, um, and then also uh, organize the EdRev um, uh, conference um, in the spring. 
Um, you'll also see on uh, your chairs um, flyers for Rocktoberfest, which is happening in a couple weeks. Um, it's one of our largest uh, fundraisers for CHC as, uh, for, uh, our, as a, we are a nonprofit. Um, we also have two schools here on site, Sand Hill School and Esther B. Clark. Okay, so the goal for today's presentation is to provide you all with an overview of the psychoeducational evaluation process, which can be kind of daunting um, because it's a complex process. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we would like to answer the following five questions for you tonight. When should I seek an evaluation for my child? Who provides psychoeducational evaluations? What does the evaluation process look like? What does the report include? And then, most importantly, what happens after the assessment is done? And so you might have many questions throughout this talk. Um, what we would love for you to do is just to write those down on your notes. Um, and we're going to reserve at least 30 minutes at the end of the presentation just for questions and answers. Um, so just jot those ideas down, and then we can have a good session at the end to respond to your questions. Um, before we get started, we would love to know who is here tonight. So maybe if you could raise your hand if you are a parent. Um, if you could raise your hand if you're a parent who has gone through an evaluation process with a child in the past. Oh, lots of hands. If you are a parent in the room and you're thinking of doing an evaluation process with your child. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so let's jump into the first question. When should I seek an evaluation for my child? Okay, so you should consider seeking an evaluation if you have any of these points come up for you. So the first one is teachers, therapists, or other providers express concern about your child's development, learning, or social emotional functioning. Now the reason we love to emphasize teachers, therapists, and other providers, of course your opinion as a parent matters, but they can oftentimes provide a really helpful perspective because they are working with several children of the same age. <laughs> so whereas a parent typically only has one eight-year-old or one 12-year-old, a teacher often has a full classroom and can really pick up on little differences in learning or behavior. So we really value the perspective often that um, teachers and therapists provide. You would also maybe want to consider an evaluation if your child's academic achievement does not seem to match up with their intellectual abilities. So what we hear a lot is, my kid is really smart but is really struggling at school. Um, so I see some heads nod. If that's something that you've heard or that you're thinking of, uh, your child seems to be really bright but has a hard time um, performing at school, um, then this might also be a good idea for you. Um, and that's similar to the second or to the third point. Um, when you feel that your child actually understands the material and is able to learn, but there's something about being able to kind of um, grasp it or put it down on paper when being assessed at school. So that could also be an indication that maybe a learning assessment can help understand what's going on. Um, oftentimes parents come in and they describe that past interventions and supports seem to be ineffective and these can be a variety of different interventions. They could be those provided by parents themselves, so a reading workbook um, or math flashcards. Um, and if that response or if the child's response to that intervention doesn't seem to be sufficient, um, then it might also point to some learning difference that we would want to look at. Could also be something like schooling um, has put into place an, an additional support for the child, and that's not really helping, or uh, outside school tutoring is not effective. And lastly, um, your child's difficulties are persisting, lasting more than one or two months. So every child tends to go through a difficult phase at school. So, but if these difficulties persist over one or two months, then you might want to consider an evaluation. So we thought it would be helpful to provide a case example to sort of guide the rest of our talk. Yeah, and one of the many hats that I wear here at CHC um, is on the care manager team. So if you have ever called the uh, Children's Health Council um, interested in services, you would be connected with one of the care managers. Um, and so as part of that role, I frequently encounter parents who are interested in services um, and are considering pursuit of an evaluation um, or a reevaluation. And Ginny and I wanted to share um, an example that is representative of um, many of the referrals that 
ultimately end up being appropriate for a psychoed evaluation. And of course, this is a de-identified compilation of, of, a, of a case, not an actual case. Um, so here we have Sam. He's an eight-year-old boy in third grade, and he's shown a growing dislike of school. Uh, so this fall, uh, during the very first parent-teacher conference, his teacher shared observations that when he's asked to read independently, he seems to have a difficult time focusing his attention. He might have a blank stare or starts to distract other kids um, at his table um, because he's starting to engage them in conversation. Um, when asked to read out loud, he sometimes puts his head on the table or he just claims that he's too tired to read. Um, and Sam's parent reports that it's increasingly harder to get Sam to get to school um, in the morning. Um, and he's also <coughs> made statements like, I'm dumb or I'm not good at this. Um, and, start, and has started to seem more worried about what other students in his class are thinking of him. Um, Interestingly, uh, this parent described that um, results from the statewide testing that was done at the end of second grade um, seemed to indicate that he was doing okay, meeting statewide um, expected levels across the different subjects. Um, yet his parents described that he's a really bright kid um, and they feel that he's just not meeting uh, his potential. Um, and they also, uh, Parents also described that the um, reading assignment that he has, uh, which is typically like 20 or 30 minutes, um, often um, becomes more contentious because um, Sam either starts to avoid the homework assignment, needs a lot of reminders, um, and can be a really protracted process, so taking closer to an hour to complete. So this is a type of case that we see very often, as Patty just said. And the task that we have is to um, do what we call a differential diagnosis. So we're going to, based on this description, we will consider different potential diagnoses, and we're going to want to use the assessment to really get more information to differentiate between them. So one thing that comes to my mind is ADHD, right? We read about inattention here, so we're going to want to assess for ADHD. We also hear that he's really smart, yet he's having a hard time at school, so a specific learning disorder is something we would want to look into here. And then we're starting to pick up on some sort of mood symptoms as well. So looking at anxiety and, and or depression as potential contributing factors. So differential diagnosis is what our task is. And part of the differential diagnosis is also, maybe this is actually quite typical, right? Um, given that he just started in, um, in a new classroom setting with a new teacher, right? So um, while we consider different diagnoses, Part of that may also be no diagnosis at all. Oh, one point that I wanted to mention here is that sometimes what we hear is that parents and teachers have different ideas of how to move forward. Um, so, you know, a parent sees a lot more behaviors that the teachers don't see at school. So, for example, the difficulties getting to school. So parents might really push for an evaluation or, or want the, the teachers to, or the school to do an assessment. And teachers oftentimes, or school, um, will point to um, the grade level or the, the, the grades that Sam is receiving and say, you know, so far he's not dropped below grade level. So sometimes that can be a little bit of a point of contention. Um, not always, but ju that's just something that parents run into sometimes. So when we do an assessment, we typically want to look at different domains of functioning. So uh, cognitive functioning, that's intelligence. Um, we want to look at attention. We want to look at executive functioning. Executive functioning is an umbrella term for things like um, planning, shifting, uh, prioritization, and impulse control. Um, we'll also want to look into learning and memory, academic achievement, and social and emotional functioning. Now, we might not consider all of these domains for every child. It really depends on the presenting problem. So depending on what information the parents provide in the initial phone call or in the initial interview, we're going to want to put together an assessment battery that really matches the kids' presenting problems. And so for Sam, for example, we might want to do cognitive functioning, look at his intelligence. Uh, we would want to take a look at attention, um, executive functioning probably, because he's having a hard time initiating. Um, academic achievement, and some social emotional functioning. So actually, Sam would get a pretty complete battery, probably. Um, 
And so we can also pull in additional um, domains or expertise. So here at the CHC, we have access to occupational therapists, to speech and language pathologists, um, and to education um, specialists who can help us run these assessments. So um, there are a number of different uh, pro types of providers in the community who have the appropriate training and background who can do psychoeducational evaluation. And the type of setting um, in which a provider um, currently works um, can, can inform uh, the scope um, and the extent of the evaluation. So we wanted to spend some time talking about who are these different providers um, so that um, as you make decisions around uh, what setting and which kind of provider may be most appropriate for your child, um, you can be very well informed. Um, so <clears throat> public school districts can offer psychoed evals. Um, uh, oftentimes these providers are uh, master's level clinicians or doctoral level clinicians um, and oftentimes their degree is in school psych, uh, possibly others. Um, and from a school district perspective, the focus on doing um, an evaluation of this nature would really be uh, with regards to determining eligibility for special education services. Um, and so these are the, uh, the categories uh, for which um, an individualized education plan or a 504 plan um, may be indicated and recommended. Um, <clears throat> An IEP, or a 504 plan, as I mentioned, um, is a collaborative plan, and it's developed by the uh, IEP team, which typically involves the, um, uh, the school counselor, um, school psychologist, um, the teacher, and other administrators, as well as parents. Um, uh, parents will uh, participate in IEP uh, meetings. <clears throat> um, and then, um, psychologists and neuropsychologists can certainly provide psychoed evals um, and they can work at places like CHC um, or other local community-based organizations um, or in private practice. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I should note, so psychologists and neuropsychologists are doctoral level medical providers um, and so um, because we're, we're trained um, as medical providers, we can um, provide diagnoses um, as, as Jenny was mentioning. Um, and so that may be uh, relevant and important for you all to consider, um, especially if you're thinking about um, evaluations as um, uh, process, a process that can support your child in the short term, but also in the long term. Um, with one potential benefit, um, and of course there are drawbacks of um, a diagnostic label, but one potential benefit of, uh, of receiving a medical diagnosis is um, insurance reimbursement um, due to mental health parity now. Um, and also, um, uh, uh, if you're interested in seeking educational accommodations um, for your child uh, while they're in elementary school, in high school, certainly you can do, uh, you can work with the school district around that. But if you are beginning to consider more long-term educational planning, um, like uh, accommodations on um, college admissions tests, um, the College Board and the ACT they they uh, require um, a medical diagnosis as well as um, a uh, demonstrated history um, for which. Uh, you as a parent and your child um, can show that there have been long-standing uh, difficulties for which educational accommodations have been um, ap applied um, historically uh, that, uh, while your child has been in school. Um, so <clears throat> I should also note, so uh, neuropsychologists may also have board certification in neuropsychology. Um, and. Um, in general, psychs and neuropsychs um, can do a both broader as well as more in-depth assessment of a child's profile uh, in terms of looking at strengths and weaknesses <clears throat> um, and um, address the, uh, f the full set of domains that Jenny had uh, talked about in the previous slide. 
Um, with that broader uh, and more in-depth assessment, we can also make um, a variety of recommendations, whether or not the recommendations are for mental health interventions or physical health interventions, like um, additional vision testing, um, uh, working with a speech language pathologist, um, working with a neurologist, and so forth. So who else provides uh, psychoed evals? Um, private practice school psychologists can do so as well. Um, these are providers who have masters or PhDs in school psych. Um, and typically when our uh, school psych um, colleagues are doing evals, um, they're typically assessing the domains of intelligence and academic skills as well as social emotional functioning. Um, they may have some training um, in some neuropsychological measures, <clears throat> um, but perhaps not as in-depth as uh, neuropsychologists who are board certified. Um, and then lastly, private practice learning specialists or ed therapists can certainly do these um, evaluations. Um, frequently, th uh, the background um, that these <coughs> providers have are master's degrees in education. Um, and the scope of the, of the evaluation, um, given their training and their background, really focuses more on academic skills. One of the benefits of um, working with an ed therapist or an ed specialist is that these providers um, often um, can continue working with your family um, to provide educational therapy or tutoring um, and continued follow-up assessment. Okay, so once you've determined that you want an evaluation and you've figured out who's going to do that, you might be wand wondering what that evaluation process might look like. So these tend to take a longer time, which can often be a little bit frustrating to parents and families who want quick answers. Um, the reason for this is that we take our time to collect a lot of relevant information. So we really want to draw on a lot of different sources and do a really thorough time. Um, so what do we look at? Um, we typically ask or provide uh, background questionnaires to families, which they then complete or bring in on their first meeting. And these are pretty expansive. So we ask about things like pregnancy, birth, um, early developmental milestones. We really want to know all of those um, pieces of information because they can really inform our uh, diagnosis and how we understand current symptoms. We'll also look at record review. So this is old report cards, or maybe there was a prior evaluation that was done several years ago, so we would love to always see those as well. We do parent and caregiver interviews. These are great because it provides us the opportunity to, to ask really specific questions and to dig deeper into certain problem behaviors or symptoms, and um, also get some examples. Those are always incredibly helpful. And then we also provide questionnaires. Questionnaires are helpful because they're often normed, so you can um, Based the responses or sort of the, the, the results that you obtain can be based on um, a comparison with other kids of the same gender and the same age. So if we think about a typical 13, 14 year old, they might present with some mood symptoms, right? So kind of irritable, cranky, uh, typical preteen. And so what we can do with questionnaires is we can look at are those mood symptoms elevated relevant, re relevant to or compared to other kids of the same age and the same gender. So super helpful. Um, school observation, that doesn't always happen, but sometimes it can be relevant and helpful, especially with younger kids. Um, collateral context, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, it's super helpful to ask teachers about their impressions, coaches, therapists, other people who work with kids across different age ranges um, can be really helpful. And then we have the testing sessions. So typically we have between two and three testing sessions, each one of which takes between two and three hours. Really, again, it depends on what you're wanting to, what type of information you're wanting to obtain. Um, and these testing sessions are pretty structured. So your child is going to work one-on-one -on -one with one adult um, person who's assessing a certain domain in a quiet room with very little distraction. Um, we provide a lot of breaks. We provide snacks. So kids actually sometimes like coming in um, because they're getting a lot of attention. What we ask parents to tell their kids is that they're going to be coming in and meeting with Dr. So-and-so, um, who's not a typical doctor. They're not going to be touching them or examining them physically, but they're going to be doing some games and some tasks with them to figure out 
what their strengths and weaknesses are because every child has strengths and weaknesses and the ultimate goal is to make things a little bit easier for the child in whichever domain um, they might be struggling. So trying to sort of sell it to your kid um, and just normalizing it, like just a bunch of games to figure out your strengths and weaknesses. Um, then we typically take a little bit of time as a team to compare all of our results, to come together, to look at all of the data that we've collected, and really thoughtfully come up with a diagnostic profile. So, um, you know, we'll, as a multi-team um, um, approach, we'll sit, come together and then um, in a feedback session invite the parents and provide some evaluation results to the parents. <laughs> Typically, we ask that the kids do not come to this first meeting just because it provides the parents and the staff or the team to give sort of a, a really detailed um, review of the results and provides the parents with an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, for teenagers, sometimes we provide um, additional second meetings for them to come in and to um, ask some questions or to have the team provide them with the results. Um, but those sessions tend to be more big picture, less you know, focused on the, the specific details of the testing. Um, and typically, again, for the feedback session, all of the team members that participated in the evaluation will be there to respond to questions. And one of the reasons why we in, uh, actually encourage um, adolescents to come for a feedback session is because they're the ones who went through the six or eight hours of testing, and they're the ones who are going to continue to go through the process of learning. And so that is one of the ways that we can really help teens learn how to advocate for themselves in an educational setting. Then we'll write up all of the results in a report, super comprehensive. Um, the report can be between 20 and 40 pages, depending on, again, the um, sort of question, referral question. Um, the report it then belongs to parents, typically, and is protected health information, and they can do with that what they want. They can provide it to share it with school, um, with physicians, with pediatricians, um, with tutors, but they don't have to. Um, so you can use it in school feedback sessions for 504 or IEP meetings, but you don't have to. It's kind of up to you and, and your child, too, to decide what you want to do with that. Of course, if um, you pursue a psychoed evaluation through the school district, it's the schools, the district is already privy to the, the results of the testing. Okay. okay, so what does the report include? So you'll see um, in, in the hefty reports that you receive back, um, different sections. Um, and so we're gonna talk about each of these different sections tonight. Um, so in the report, you'll see uh, presenting problems, also known as referral questions, or why, um, why are parents uh, seeking uh, the process of a psychoed eval. <clears throat> um, also background and history, uh, the results of the, uh, of the process of evaluation. Um, overall impressions and uh, diagnoses, if, ap if applicable. Um, and then, of course, recommendations. And frankly, I think in, in my experience working with parents, you know, uh, of course, um, having a clarification around um, a student's profile is, is helpful, but so what? Right? It's really about the game plan and the recommendations for moving forward. Um, and so this is really where I encourage parents to spend a bulk of their, their time and energy looking at what is this game plan and having a conversation with all the relevant um, people who would be important as part of that plan. <clears throat> Okay, so um, after you've, your, your family has gone through the process of the testing sessions um, and you've gone through the feedback session where you've had the face-to-face -face with the providers doing the eval, um, you get this report, typically in the mail. Um, and here at CHC, if you uh, go through the process with us, um, the report comes four weeks after uh, the feedback session. Um, and I frequently recommend parents to start at the end of the report, um, right where it says impressions and recommendations. Um, why start at the end? It's because that's where the summary is. Um, so the summary is typically one to two pages that summarizes all the preceding 20 to 30 pages. Um, and <clears throat> In, that in the summary, um, you'll see a write-up of 
what was the referral question? What was the scope of the evaluation? And overall, like, what are the take homes? Like, who is this child holistically? Um, preceding that, you'll see, you know, all the results <coughs> with nitty gritty details, a lot of details. Um, but the summary really has the take home. So, who is this child when you see them at school? Who might this child be when you see them at home? or at, with friends. Um, and it, the summary um, is really less focused on numbers and more specifically about how the results of the testing translate into real life. So for example, if in the feedback session you learn that your child is um, scoring within the average range overall um, with regards to their intellectual functioning, that's great. W what does that actually mean? Uh, that would mean um, in an academic setting, you would expect that they would be able to absorb um, and learn information that is presented to them in a general education setting. But that, um, that domain in and of itself doesn't explain why a student may not be um, performing as we might expect, which is why we have such a multifaceted way to do the eval. Um, and so, uh, the uh, diagnostic, sorry, the impressions and the summary um, really, I think, distills very nicely um, in um, in parent friendly, in provider friendly uh, terms, um, so that this report can be a working document f to support your family moving forward. Um, you'll also see recommendations. Um, so again, the recommendations are the action plan uh, to support your child's particular profile. As Jenny mentioned, you know, every student is different. We can expect um, that uh, there will be strengths and there will also be areas of um, challenges or things uh, that parents, that pro other providers, that other adults working with a child um, or teen um, can support and bolster. <clears throat> Recommendations are really truly uh, intended to be tailored to your particular student. And so if, if you're noticing that uh, some of the recommendations um, seem, seem more kind of stock or like copy pasted, that is something that you should certainly talk to your provider about. Um, because ideally, again, the recommendations are for you and your family um, for this point in time to how to support your child in the short term and sometimes the recommendation will be to come back for a reevaluation in two or three years. <coughs> every child grows and changes, especially when we start to do interventions. <clears throat> and a reevaluation uh, may be uh, uh, recommended um, in order to get updates on uh, where and how successful certain interventions have gone and where to go moving forward how, and how to move forward. So public schools have for triangulate, so they, of course, they, yes. they need to do it every few years. Yes, yes. Um, and one thing, uh, so a couple things to note um, in, in the recommendations section. So um, <clears throat> if a student qualifies for educational accommodations, and qualifications for educational accommodations um, come from um, the particular uh, results and the, the observations that uh, we as providers um, uh, see when we are actually doing the standardized testing. Um, and so <clears throat> the accommodations are truly considered scaffolds and not necessarily crutches. I know sometimes when I meet with parents, um, parents or even uh, the teens that I do feedback sessions with feel a bit uncomfortable um, really advocating for themselves to, to use these accommodations because they feel like, oh gosh, it, it actually indicates that I'm weak, weaker or not as good as my, my peers if I need um, one and a half time um, or if I need to have a note card or uh, other you know, um, supports that would help them to demonstrate their knowledge. Um, but, but the way I think about ed accommodations are it's a way to um, help level the playing field so that students can really demonstrate what they know um, and also to be able to be in a um, educational or classroom setting and absorb as much information as they can relative <coughs> to their other peers who are in, in that setting. Um, 
And when we talk about recommendations with our, with our teens, with our students, um, it's part of this longer process um, that I alluded to earlier of um, helping our teens to really understand how to effectively advocate for themselves. It's l helping them to learn how to learn, helping them to um, really truly understand what is their particular profile, um, how can they um, allow themselves to really shine in all these different settings. Okay. So, um, continuing to break down this Wieldy report. So, um, after looking at the, uh, the summary and the recommendations, flip back to the beginning of the report um, and review uh, the presenting problems and history section. Um, <clears throat> this is the section that also includes the summary of um, what the other um, adults who were part of the um, uh, part of the evaluation process um, and uh, what concerns they they had noted. Um, this is also a careful documentation uh, that's relevant to answering why you're seeking a psychoed eval. Um, and important again to think about the evaluation report as a as a working document, but also a, a document that uh, that details the history. Um, it's a it's a way to reference. Um, it's a way for other people who are reviewing the document to reference that yes, the recommendations that this provider is advocating for your child um, is truly indicated because look at all the history that has um, been summarized. <clears throat> it's very important to review for accuracy um, because uh, part of what we do is as psychologists um, we. We listen to, parent, to what parents' concerns are um, verbatim, but we don't write down what is said to us directly. We are um, distilling that information down um, in a way that is um, easily translatable to the different eyes that may be looking at the report moving forward. So um, between the verbatim understanding and that conversation that we have with parents during the initial uh, intake assessment, um, we want to make sure that we as providers translated it, uh, translated our understanding in a way that feels comfortable to parents. So of course, uh, um, it's very important to review. <clears throat> if you have any questions about what's written or how it's written, um, make sure to follow up with your uh, with the evaluator. Okay, so moving on to the results section, which can always be a little bit daunting because it typically includes statistics and numbers, which are a little bit less easily digestible. Um, so I'm sure most of you have seen the normal distribution curve, but it can just be super helpful to review and to keep in mind as you're reading through the results section. Um, the distribution that we have up here um, describes how any population is distributed on a given characteristic. So the typical ones that we think about are height, weight, intelligence, and we think that the population, it could be the overall population of the US or the population of eight-year-old males, is distributed in this type of shape. Um, so focusing on intelligence and using that as an example, Let's say that Sam's intelligence was found to be at 100, so the standard score of 100 would mean that he's in the average range. He's at the 50th percentile, which means that he's higher than or similar to 50% of the peers his age and gender. And scaled score is something that you might also see in a, in a report. It just is a smaller number of the overall score. But 100 is the average. We know that about 68% of the population fall within one standard deviation to the left and to the right of the mean. So what that means for IQ is that we know that 68% of the population will have an IQ between 85 and 115. So throughout the report, you're gonna see things like percentile, standard score, st scaled score, and having something like this next to the report as you're reading it is helpful. What we always encourage parents to look at are the qualitative descriptive descriptors, which you can't really see, unfortunately. But we have, here's the average, average range, low average, very low, and extremely low. And then we move to high average, very high, and extremely high. And having those in mind as you're reading through the report can be incredibly helpful. 
Another way that I find is very helpful to think about the results is distinguishing between an inter-individual and intra-individual profile. So focusing first on the inter-individual, that's kind of going back to the slide that I just showed. It's thinking about your child and their performance or symptom or um, ability relative to other kids of the same age. So I'm actually gonna go back to the curve. Um, so if you think about Sam, as I said, his IQ is found to be at 100, um, which is you know close to most kids his age. So he's at the 50th percentile. So we can compare Sam to other kids uh, around his age on things like IQ, um, anxiety um, symptoms, depressive symptoms. Another way to think about um, results is to look at the intra-individual profile. So this is kind of what Patty said in terms of every child has their own profile. It's like their fingerprint. So we look at removing, you know, not thinking about Sam relative to his peers, we think about Sam as an individual and within his profile, what are the strengths and weaknesses? So using intelligence again as an example, we can think about him having a specific strength in processing speed or visual spatial ability. So let's say he's really good at, at figuring out different relationships between object, objects. But maybe his verbal ability is a little bit lower than most of his, the rest of his profile. And when we see that in kids, we typically see them being a little bit frustrated to not be able to express or kind of share their strengths, right? So maybe having a good idea, but kind of having a hard time articulating that idea. So it's helpful to look at their profile of strengths and weaknesses, and that can really inform how we want to intervene and support the child. So some last things that are really important to keep in mind as you're reading the report and taking in all of this information. Um, so the evaluation and the results capture just one snapshot in time, right? So as Patty said earlier, kids develop in tremendous ways. They have different growth spurts. So keep in mind that this is um, a reflection of your kid's performance at this given time. That being said, we do know that certain results tend to be somewhat stable over time, right? So we do know that intelligence is probably not going to bounce by a tremendous amount. It's, it's viewed to be pretty stable. But just keep in mind that there is some variability and kids do grow at different rates, in particular if we put in some interventions to support growth. The second point speaks to the fact that a child will have some variability in their performance. So let's say they come in on Monday morning, they had a really busy weekend, they didn't sleep very well, their testing session is 7.30 in, in the morning, they're not really morning people, that might reflect on the results, right? So it kind of depends on how your kid is doing that given day um, and um, how the testing session went. Maybe they're a little bit nervous about meeting a new adult. Um, so keep in mind that your child has some variability and that leads to some measurement error. And then the third point here, assessment instruments are regularly updated and revised. That means that assessment instruments are not perfect themselves. Um, so there is also something we call measurement error. So a little bit of error throughout measurement. Um, that being said, the measures that we used are all validated and um, a lot of research has gone into making them reliable and valid measures and um, they are often revised. So we think they're pretty good, but they're not perfect, right? So e e every measure that we use has some strengths and some weaknesses. Great, so what happens after the assessment process is done? Um, so the completed evaluation report, um, if it's completed by a psychologist or a neuropsychologist, it is considered PHI, or protected health information. Um, and so <clears throat> that means um, it, in order for the provider to share that report with uh, anyone else, including a school or school district, um, a parent would need to sign a release of information form. So what I tell parents typically is that the report is theirs to disseminate. Um, it's their child's protected health information, and so the parent can, uh, parents can choose um, and, and make educated decisions around how the report gets shared. Um, if there is a report, or sorry, if uh, part of the reason why a family is seeking um, a psychoeducational uh, evaluation is uh, concerns around social and emotional functioning, and there's um, information about a you know detailed family psychiatric history. Um, sometimes parents um, have concerns about disseminating that to 
to you know a broad audience, um, and so it is completely reasonable and not uncalled for um, f to have a discussion with your provider around uh, creating what is called a redacted uh, report that can be shared specifically, specifically, excuse me, with the school um, or you know, for example, a music teacher or, or, or coach, right? Because again, it's your child's. Uh, private health information. Um, if after reviewing the report, again, if you have any questions about um, what's written in the report or the the um, the process of the evaluation, follow up with your provider. Um, <clears throat> um, and of course, if the evaluation was conducted outside of the school district, um, then it would be up to the parents, um, and is typically strongly recommended by the provider to share the. Uh, the report with uh, the school district um, for, to establish uh, first an SST or a student uh, student success team meeting, um, or an individual individualized education plan. Um, <clears throat> One thing that I'd also note is uh, during the feedback session, um, here at CHC, uh, the feedback sessions are typically two hour meetings. Um, <coughs> and uh, sometimes um, parents are, uh, of course, um, coming with uh, a lot of expectations um, and starting to anticipate lots of different potential outcomes. Um, and so I always like to reassure parents at the very beginning of those feedback meetings that you are going to hear 100% of the information. What you'll remember when you come home will probably be a significantly smaller portion of that. And so that's one of the reasons why you will have a tangible report so that you can review and that you can refer back to over and over again if needed. <clears throat> Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, typically the reevaluation um, that's recommended is two or three years, especially if um, you are hoping to uh, seek educational accommodations through um, the college board or th through the ACT. Um, All right, and so lastly, um, Ginny and I wanted to uh, point you all to um, this list of resources. <clears throat> so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the website understood.org, um, it's, a, it's a really great uh, free resource online. Um, it's a joint initiative um, by over, I believe, a dozen nonprofits that um, come from um, you know, a variety of uh, backgrounds, but with the shared goal and mission of supporting students with uh, special learning needs whether or not that's due to learning, uh, a diagnosable learning disability um, or more social and emotional functioning concerns. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, um, our resource library um, is free and available um, uh, for you to peruse. And then rightslaw.com um, is a website um, that's uh, specifically for uh, special education law and advocacy. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, the, uh, the two people who uh, initially started this, uh, this resource, um, they're a married couple. Um, I believe uh, one of the partners is an attorney um, who, uh, ha who grew up with uh, learning differences and learning challenges himself. Um, and so his specialty is in special education law. Um, and then uh, the, the other partner um, is a psychotherapist who frequently works with kids and, and supporting families. Um, uh, for whom who for whom are trying to advocate for their students with special needs, um, and of course. Um here at CHC, we do offer free 30-minute consultations here. Um, so the way to get connected uh, with those um, are to is to call uh, this number or to email um, help at chconline.org, um, and you would likely connect with either me over the phone um, or um, one of my uh, uh, care manager colleagues, and we would work with you to hear a little bit more about the nature of your concerns and then uh, set up a, an appointment with one of our psychologists or neuropsychologists. Um, and those consultations can happen um, either over the phone 
um, <coughs> or you're welcome to come into our clinic to meet with our psychologists or neuropsychologists face to face. It's not considered a clinical intervention. It's really a way to um, have your questions answered around what is the next best step in terms of a recommendation for uh, you know, whether or not your child might benefit from a comprehensive psychoed evaluation or um, continuing to or initiating services with a mental health provider or going back to your pediatrician. Um, but again, it's a, uh, it's a service that we um, are very fortunate to be able to provide to, to families. Is that also true for the South Bay? Go to that site? Good question. Um, so uh, typically the 30-minute consults um, are done here in Palo Alto. Um, but if your family lives in the South Bay, then you're, you're of course, um, available to do a phone consultation. All right. And now we can move to questions. Um, the school versus the private, yeah. um, if there is already a school neuropsych or psych educational assessment, is it worth to go and get a private one? Like, is that a situation where it comes up a lot or like, because I do feel like they are more for the side of the school and I just wanted to hear that opinion. You know, so I think it really depends on, um, what the referral question is, so what your question is as a parent, um, and whether or not the, the scope of the evaluation that you received from the school district answers your question in a way that, that sits well for you. If you still feel like, hmm, you know, I don't feel like they were thoroughly able to answer certain areas, um, then it may be worthwhile pursuing a more in-depth psychoed eval with an outside provider. Um, you know, as I mentioned um, earlier, um, the purpose of the school district evaluation um, is quite different than the, the purpose and, uh, of an evaluation that can be conducted um, in a private practice setting or in a clinic setting. Um, again, for the school district, um, the question that they are trying to answer is, does this child require special education services? Or does this child require, if not special ed, um, different kinds of accommodations, perhaps through a 504 plan, um, in order for a child to um, appropriately um, receive, or uh, set a child up to appropriately receive a um, least restrictive and fair education. Um, one of the limitations of that, though, is that, um, uh, and again, it varies from school district to school district, um, that there are particular cutoffs that they're looking for with regards to when a child does qualify for extra supports. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I leave it up to parents, um, but is, it is a frequent question that we get. Um, Sometimes we'll have parents who've already gone through the process with the school district, um, and you know we'll try to do uh, the try to pursue the supports through the IEP as designated by the school, um, and yet the parents still have this gut feeling like this does not quite feel um, like it's really answering what my core concern is. And if you have that gut feeling after talking and having um, meetings with your IEP team, then it may be worth considering an outside eval. A follow up: Is there do the schools ever have an issue with a private evaluation and yeah. pushback? Yeah. Or is it just Great question. Great question. Do you want to take that? Or do you want I w could I just one quick follow up about the the last question? Just one thing to keep in mind is that some assessment measures we can only administer within a certain time yes. frame. So if the school just did uh, the WISC five, which is a common intelligence um, test, we would not be able to re-administer that within a certain amount of time. So that's also something to keep in mind um, when you're picking or figuring out when and who to test with. 
um, really putting the battery together and making sure that the kid hasn't already just completed it because then the second t time they're completing it, it's not considered to be valid because they kind of could potentially remember the stuff. So that's just something that I wanted to throw in there too. There's a cheat sheet of that online, like three years. Um, you know, you I don't know about a cheat sheet, but you could probably actually look just if you have the report available. Rights law, okay. The good news is, is that for a lot of the, so if you're wanting to look at intelligence, there are more than just one test of intelligence. So if yeah. you've used test A, then the second time around, if you wanted to do it six months later, you would just be cautious to tell the testing person and then they would use test B. But just something to keep in mind. Yeah, And that's one of the reasons why, as providers, we really want to get a full record, a uh, full set of records that we can review so that we can appropriately choose um, the most appropriate uh, testing battery. Um, and then, so your question was, As does the school you, district... You choose to go the private route. Are those accepted by the school district? I mean, is there ever any like, pushback or disagreements? Or... Yeah, I'll, I'll be very transparent and very frank about that. So um, certain school <laughs> districts can, uh, will, you know, certainly like outright see, okay, you know, this is a report that was done by a reputable agency in the community. Um, you know, we know that the, they aren't making recommendations that uh, would be um, inappropriate for a student. And so they'll take the, the report as is and will work with you to implement the recommendations in the school uh, setting. Um, other school districts will take that and will say, you know what, I want to do, we'll do our own testing. Um, and so, um, you know, that is, that is the reality and that is, um, from a school district's perspective, they're right because um, any time a, a student um, qualifies for special education services, um, that is accounted for as part of their budget, right? So um, they'll, they'll be quite careful. Um, so <clears throat> part of what we do as providers is work with parents to advocate around um, what the process might look like given the results of the testing um, and, um, and can provide assistance or uh, connect you, connect parents with um, other organizations in the community that can uh, consistently help to advocate for you to get the services that your, your child qualifies for from a medical perspective. Do you ever attend IEP meetings and then have the system at your position to support your report? Uh, your question was, uh, do psychologists or neuropsychologists ever attend IEP meetings um, in order to advocate for families? And the answer is yes. We're happy to do that. You commented there's cutoffs in the public school system mm -hmm. that they're looking to see if the child qualifies for official services in the public school uh -huh. and then they're committed to that. Those cutoff numbers are really kind of very low average, particularly for this environment, the Silicon Valley. Um, I've been teaching in Catholic schools for 15 years and if a child is, you know, they're just discrepancy between one or another, the public school, the public public, they're average, but they're not average in the South. So you need to look closely at that. They will only do the tests that they are required to do. And you had said they don't do a diagnosis. Correct. Right? And they, so they're not going to diagnose dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, not recommend meds. So you would get a much more thorough to your unique child if you come here. <laughs> and to give a much better report because then what I would do in my school is take their report, fine tune it to a two pager for the teachers to have an action plan to make it work in the classroom. And that's what you're, look, you're looking at all those nuances of your child. They can pull out another test, a behavior test or anxiety or whatever. If they're seeing that, but they hear that from you, they can take it to the next level. But and to, to follow up on your comment, um, thank you. Um, so Ginny's slide around inter and intra-individual differences, I think, uh, speaks to this topic that we're talking about. So from a school district perspective, um, oftentimes what they're looking at is how does this student compare to other 
students in their grade level versus how, but the question that parents are oftentimes really wanting to answer is, how does the student compare to themselves? Yes, please. Um, I actually have a college who um, was diagnosed with ADHD and went back, you know, like, you know, first grade. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the school district, you know, did the, you know, triennials. Um, but is now in college, you know, um, you know, smack in the middle, um, and they're still struggling. You know, the, and it's been probably five or six years since, you know, his last full evaluation, you know, back in high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to get him, you know, the proper help. Is it worth it to, you know, have another full evaluation done? Does the college do that? Or should I look for, you know, a private, you know, educational specialist in his, you know, college area? I don't quite know where to start. Yeah, good question. Do you want to take this? Maybe I'll start with, um, and then you can jump in. Sure. Um, my understanding is that the school will typically, or the college will typically have something like an accessibility office, and you can reach out to them and ask them what their common procedures are. Sometimes they can do an evaluation, or they can refer out or recommend somebody in the in the community that they work with. Sometimes they have evaluation services provided within the, the school. So I would really start with them. Um, but then certainly we do see parents who go and get a private reevaluation and then have the kid bring that back to the accessibility office and then get accommodations. Mm -hmm. um, At that point, though, um, your, your college student is considered a legal adult, yeah. right? So um, if you as a parent want to be part of that process, they would need to sign releases in order for, for, um, for you to share information with the psychologist who does the reevaluation. So just be prepared for that. Um, and um, considering that your, your son had a medical diagnosis, um, I think I would, to follow up on the comments um, that Ginny had stated, uh, find out whether or not the <coughs> providers through the through the college um, would be able to make recommendations ac around accommodations specific to a medical diagnosis because it would be kind of a parallel um, parallel concern is what we were just talking about in terms of school district uh, or uh, a college um, now mm -hmm. providing providing determination around and eligibility. In, in fact, with ADHD, we consider that to be a neurodevelopmental disorder, which is considered to be stable. So sometimes what suffices is for you to bring an old testing report to the school, and they should think that it's a stable diagnosis. His symptom profile might, ha might have changed, but they should be able to accept a prior evaluation. Is it worth it to do an update? And um, his main challenge right now is he can't function. Mm -hmm. I'm just finding an executive functioning. Coach. And I did, I'm a university professor, indeed, and the type of accommodations that most colleges and universities provide are very limited yeah. in comparison to elementary, middle, high school, and stuff. And so the evaluation you want to get would be much more, should be much more directed to your son about what he can do to try to accommodate his learning differences and, and whatnot. So I think a lot of parents are disappointed that there aren't more. Even with schools with very, very good accessibility disability services, they're much more geared, less geared towards learning difficulties and more geared for physical handicaps and things like that. I'm a college consultant for students with learning differences, and we do college preparation, planning, and placement, but also we have students, in fact, my daughter had the same experience. Um, and there's a different law that covers, the ADA covers at the college level, mm -hmm. not the IDEA. So every school isn't required to have an equal playing field, as you were saying. Um, so it depends on the child, and there are wonderful resources available for executive functioning coaching, remotely even. Um, so I can talk to you about that afterwards, but um, it's, it is an issue that I'm sure you, with the age group that you test, um, <coughs> that those students know and the families know that it's a different ball game after 
18. Um, it makes a really big difference, and especially if students have, as adolescents, have had accommodations and provisions, that it's a, just every, every college is different. And they're only required to have accessibility. They're not required to all provide the same services. And, and which makes the choice of college and university. If you know that your son or daughter is going to need help and stuff, that's a critical factor. It, it is. And that's where you know our practice comes in. But not everybody is aware of that. Um, so it's something you want to look at if you're looking at colleges. Do your home, try to do as much homework as you can. What, what is your title? So it's a college. I am, I am a college consultant for students with learning differences and ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. I'm an in, independent educational consultant. Yeah, Maybe just because you live here from Canada, and my son had a request to done with the colleges there. Uh -huh. So when we got here, the school said we can use it. They wanted to do their own assessment and they came with completely different results. <laughs> but the psychologist at home gave me the raw score. Uh -huh. Would I be able to find someone here that could help do a new assessment with those scores or would I have to do a whole new assessment? How recently was the eval done? March. March. So we moved here in April. Okay. I wondered if your the treating psychologist or the provider um, might be able to um, not just include the raw scores, but how that translates into standard scores, scaled scores. That. Okay, so you have that. And then she gave me the raw scores because she said sometimes when it's a different country, like there's different benchmarks, uh -huh. raw scores would be the true number, <laughs> the true score, mm -hmm. just in case you ran into problems. Mm -hmm. So, what are your thoughts? I mean, in Canada and the US, not that different. No, it's yeah, not, it's not that different. and um, and. The CPA and the APA, Canadian Psych Association and APA, are very, they f follow very similar rules around uh, using um, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, for making a diagnosis. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this marinate a little bit and we'll take, I'll take it offline with you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. This is kind of a little bit related in that <coughs> I have an American student who's had, um, it, perhaps an assessment through the school, uh -huh. and perhaps like if you want more detail, like you want, like you said, you want more. If you come and do a independent assessment, and you bring like they've already had the intelligence test, so can can you re, can you use that data that the school is already providing, or is there some validity concerns where you have to do all of your own testing again? Do you know? Do you understand my I, question? Yeah, I understand your question. Um, from so my take as a provider, I would not take the, the results of um, testing done by another provider. Um, I personally would, would recommend uh, doing a reevaluation um, because, you know, of course, standardized tests are intended to be done in a standardized way. Um, but uh, depending on how recent that previous evaluation was done, things can shift and change over time. Um, and it would, it would be my, if, if that, if you were coming into my office, I would do a reevaluation. I just did a reevaluation. I tested a kid who was 11, I think, had a test done in September or a comprehensive evaluation, and we retested her this summer, and we did a complete start from zero. We just used different tests mm -hmm. that hadn't been used before. Um, I think it would really weaken your report or our report if we were to just draw in prior results. I think it's much better if it's all done at the same time with the same team um, because we don't know how what their training background is and even if they're extremely well trained, I think just having it all done um, fresh if we have the opportunity. If there's yeah. Yeah, if the opportunity presents itself. Yeah. yeah. And sorry, I just thought, and do you ever supplement like uh, like if a parent comes and says, oh, like, okay, we have a diagnosis, we know what's going on, but we're just, we want to dig deeper into like this particular spot, then you could tailor your testing to just Absolutely. that thing. Yes. And so that's why, again, why it's really important to have the full set of records um, to determine how much deeper to go into. Um, because uh, we as psychologists and neuropsychologists, we have access to a wide variety of assessment measures. 
Um, and in many ways, the evaluation process is both a science as well as an, as an art um, to really answer a parent's question, but also to predict, you know, how's, what are the constellations of difficulties that a child is having right now, and how can we really tap into really truly deeply understanding um, where these difficulties are coming from. And sometimes with previous evaluations, they've evaluated maybe three different domains, um, but they didn't zoom into a particular domain that might actually explain other, um, other difficulties. And as we said, each assessment has its, or measurement instrument has its strengths and weaknesses. So even if we redo an intelligence test with a second measure, that can yield really relevant information. It can confirm what we found previously, or it can kind of shed light onto the little nuances that we haven't found previously. So mm -hmm. that would be my recommendation. Yes, please. So am I understanding that just psychologists and neuropsychologists can diagnose? Correct. School psychologists? Cannot, private practice school psychologists do not diagnose? No. To my knowledge, no. Specialists. So the benefit of having a diagnosis is for, you can um, prescribe medication and insurance purposes. And what are the other great benefits? Yeah, so uh, just to clarify, so as psychologists and neuropsychologists, we would not prescribe medications. Um, so that would be coming from our uh, psychiatry colleagues, our MD colleagues. Um, psychologists and neuropsychs have a, a degree of PsyD or PhD. Um, to, uh, so, but to your question around, so what are the other benefits of working with a psych or a neuropsych? Um, I think it's really just the ability for providers with that training and background um, to um, to assess a variety of constructs and then uh, determine how deeply to, uh, to do that assessment. Um, you know, because there are types of uh, measures that we can use to, uh, to quickly like rule in or rule out. And if we have a, um, if we are starting to collect data that, hmm, this is an area of concern, then we can move more, more deeply into further assessment of that. That the others can't do. I don't believe so, no. Yeah. Sorry, right behind you. Yes. Um, so we're at a school that uh, really did we believe in early intervention. Uh -huh. But the problem with that is um, our, the school district will not test kids until we can prove that they are more than two years behind, which like, that's hard. Um, so what we've been doing is we've, we've been referring through DBP. Um, but then a developmental behavioral pediatrician. Um, but one, the wait list is extremely long to get our kids into there. And two, a lot of times the DP has said, like, they probably have a specific learning disability, but like, they're too young for us to diagnose that, like, wait a bit longer. And so my question is, like, when, when do you recommend us to, like, actually send somebody through you guys to do a psycho ed email? Um, and when is it, like, we're, at, we're too young still? Like, we've had kids that are falling, like, they're having like a 71 on their IQ. So it's like, okay, you don't have intellectual disability, but like you probably really need help. Mm -hmm. um, but like no one's willing to give us any type of like guidance on which way we should go next. With, so I, I really appreciate um, getting uh, records from developmental uh, behavioral pediatricians because they are um, really well trained to, and Surprisingly, not all pediatricians um, are really trained across uh, development. Um, and, and to really be able to focus on the littles, the under fives, um, is a specialization of our, of our uh, pediatrician colleagues. Um, I'm reflecting on my own experience working uh, with, with younger kids who I would have a strong suspicion that um, further down the line, they would qualify for a specific learning disability. Um, however, uh, in certain cases, and I'm thinking of a couple of cases where I was testing a 
five-year-old and then a six-year-old and a seven-year-old who I suspect would eventually qualify for a diagnosis of an SLD, specific learning disability, but because of their age and because of um, how much time they've had uh, with regards to exposure to the educational setting, um, um, what my f uh, final diagnostic impressions were to rule out um, uh, an SLD. Um, and so what that means is that it is an alert to providers um, and teachers and, um, and to parents uh, that early intervention is really important. So you can focus on reading or you can focus on basic, uh, learning basic math uh, facts and, or sorry, math knowledge um, and concepts um, to kind of shore up the existing discrepancy between a child's um, intellectual abilities which indicates capacity, but also what they're able to demonstrate in terms of their academic skill set. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Your question was more around like w at what age? Yeah, because we so we start full time school for our kids at three, uh -huh. right? And so they're with us. They're three, they're four, they're five, they're uh -huh. six. We're like we've known them for four years, yeah. and then we send them to somebody else, and they're like they're too young to have them in school enough. Like yeah. they've been in school for four years. <laughs> what age? What age? Does so what age education? Should we do it? So you want to take this? Well, uh, one way to think about this question, which I think is really great, is to think about what we typically look at for a specific learning disorder is both intelligence, as Patty said, and then ability to perform. And both of those are still growing at such a f fast rate at that age. Mm -hmm. Especially intelligence, the earlier we test it, the less reliable or valid the score is actually viewed to be. Yes. So you can test a three-year-old. The predictive validity of retest at age six and nine is not very great. So I, what I've heard psychologists say most of the time is like five or six, it's too, too young. You could maybe have do some testing and sort of, as Patty said, do like a rule out, which just means keep an eye out on this, continue to monitor. But we would also not want to give a label to a kid that young. So we don't know their IQ yet. It's still developing. Likewise, with academic functioning, there's a lot of growth still. So I would really, I think what I've heard is like six, seven, eight, um, maybe even a little older than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I've tested um, as young as four okay. and five. Um, but again, the results are still very much a um, kind of a working diagnosis or set of impressions. But really, um, you know, when we're working with families, it's less about the diagnosis per se, and it's more about the recommendations, right? So um, one of the wonderful things about working with kids and teens is that there's so much opportunity for growth and change. And so, you know, you can do and you could do an evaluation um, and really focus less on specific labels and more around, so what is the game plan? What were the recommendations around shoring up areas which are currently demonstrating areas of concern? And so you think that those recommendations could be given around five or six? Oh, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like we were talking a little bit about like more of the academic testing, like IQ and things like that, but I know that socio-emotional testing is also part of the psychoeducational. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in that respect, you know, with that, if we are concerned about a student that's having socio-emotional concerns, even though they might be fairly young, mm -hmm. Would we be able to get beyond the rule out in your opinion? With regards to social and emotional concerns? Yeah. Yeah. That's where the questionnaires are super helpful that are normed, right? So you can look at a three year old, you might see a few temper tantrums every day, and then you kind of throw it into look at the existing data set, and then you'll see, like, relative to other three year olds who are males, this is actually pretty elevated. We'd want to intervene early, definitely. Yeah. 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 And so I'm thinking about, uh, for example, autism spectrum disorder, mm -hmm. right? We can start doing that testing quite early. 18 months or 18 like months, when you're two years, years yeah. right? So, so and as part of that evaluation, you know, yeah. we would still do a, a, an evaluation of adaptive functioning, right? So, and, yeah. If you think about the different domains that we're assessing, social emotional would be one of the earliest things that we'd want to test. It's things like IQ, academic functioning, attention, that sort of develops a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Um, but especially those social emotional things, early intervention is key. Yeah. Yes. I've got a comment and then a couple of questions. Yeah, please. Uh, comment uh, from the standpoint I've got twins that were both uh, diagnosed, well, excuse me, they were both assessed to the school district when they were five and six. And then we were in a situation where things didn't quite, like there's something wrong we need to know. We've gone out and gotten private uh, assessment. 
where we got diagnoses, some of which were emerging, uh, you know, because at that point we couldn't tell for sure dyslexia or you know, like mm -hmm. the, the signs and points that and the set of recommendations. And what was hugely different to us that we didn't know we would know at the end of that is that we had kind of trusted the school district that they're applying these supports and interventions and great, you know, that's going to help. But until we had that bigger picture or what we were looking at as a long term, we didn't know to go back and ask for some other specific interventions with, because the ones that were being applied, though they were giving her a lot of minutes, weren't helping with her specific issues until we had that sense of, it was just helped to focus us on what types of interventions we should be asking for, not just the ones that are convenient to the school district to, to provide, because that's what they're used to doing. Mm -hmm. So even as early as five and six, it was hugely helpful yeah. for us to do that. Um, my question is a very separate thing, but for a child that's, that's been diagnosed with ADHD and is currently taking ADHD meds, if they're coming in for a new assessment, well, do you want them on the meds or not on the meds when they're testing, like uh, through the whole battery? Or would there be some test that you would want them on? I say off the meds is what I've typically done. Oh, I've been told to have them on the meds. Really? Yeah. Like 100%. Don't even come in the door. Yeah. 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 If you're. Sorry, that's um, the yeah. If your child is um, doing well <laughs> and stable on the medications, and you're the provider, the um, uh, psychiatrist that you're working with um, isn't making any changes around the medications. Um, my approach, um, and several of our colleagues uh, here um, ask for um, performance with, uh, sorry, to do the testing with the medications. I've been, tra I've, I just started here, so I was trained in Burlington, Vermont, and there it was a slightly different approach, but yeah. interesting to see. Might yeah. be it's due to like the school system or, yeah. for us they said take them off for the day. Well, I think, you know, it, it also really depends on the, the student, right? Um, because, uh, you know, sometimes it's not just ADHD medications that a student is taking. Sometimes it's ADHD medications plus uh, medications for bipolar disorder, right? So, you know, we want to, we do want to get an assessment of a student's um, functioning, right? Um, and with the medications, you know, they, they may be performing at their ideal, right? Um, so I, th I think we take it very much on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, please. Do you have any recommendations for how to go about sharing a child's learning profile with them after they've been assessed, especially mm -hmm. at the elementary age? Mm -hmm. um, and do you think there's an appropriate age to share that with them, mm -hmm. based on your expertise? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a really good question. We hear it a lot. Um, I really do think it's in the way you present it to your kids. And it sort of goes back to the way you presented going through the evaluation process at the beginning, right? So we know that everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. And this evaluation was done to help you, you know, figure out how your brain works best. Um, and from this evaluation, we learned that these are your strengths and these are your kind of areas for growth. And you can even model some as a parent, like for me, you know, math was really challenging, but reading was really easy. And I learned to, you know, kind of accommodate or learn new strategies. So I think you could totally normalize and then also model um, and, and then just present it in a really human um, kind of welcoming way. And then just also game plan moving forward. Like how do we, what do we do about this? Um, I don't think you necessarily have to use labels like you were diagnosed with a specific learning disorder. But again, it's kind of, it, it, it depends on your parenting style and your parenting approach. Some parents really like to be transparent. Some parents really don't like using labels. So um, that's something actually that you can bring up in the feedback session, talking to all the, you know, the, the people who tested your child. You can kind of brainstorm around language and kind of practice the script and come up with what feels best for you and, and a partner or you and your child. Um, but yeah, I would definitely normalize and just say strengths and weaknesses um, and just everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a really good question. This comes up for us, you know, across different disciplines, like in the medical field. Like, do you tell a child that they have a certain, you know, diabetes or, you know, even cancer, pediatric cancer? And it really, I think it depends on your kind of style as a parent um, and what feels right for you and what aligns with other domains of how you parent. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong. Um, I do think that whatever route you go, it can be done in a really sensitive and um, thoughtful way. Um, so continuing with talking about labels a little bit more, um, is learning differences and learning disorders can be used interchangeably? And then also related to that, when the school district is looking at a specific learning disability in order to serve an eligibility, how does that include more than just the FOD? I'm just curious, from your perspective, how you look at learning, the learning differences and learning um, disabilities, are those one and the same? Are they slightly different? Sure, I can start. Um, so I think of, so the way the DSM, which we've mentioned, the diagnostic book that we use, um, that talks about specific learning disorders. So the word disorder is in there. So that's sort of the clinical term that we use. Um, again, if you're giving that feedback to your child, you can use that or you don't have to. You could say something like learning differences. Um, I think of learning differences as being a more umbrella term and then learning disorder as being more specific and more sort of clinical. Um, so learning differences could be like, I am a visual learner. Um, I learn through visual information, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I have some sort of visual processing um, or some other disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's differences is a little bit more broad and less sort of clinical. Yes. On the uh, distribution curve, where would you draw the line and say, okay, if you're below this line or number, um, there's a concern and you need to think into it. Depends on what you're looking at, I think. So um, the nice thing is that most measures will provide cutoff scores, so clinical level cutoff scores. They're typically 75, right, for a T-score, or is it 65? 65 or 75? I'm blanking. 65. Right. 65 and, of, and over is typically what we think of as a T-score as being clinically elevated, but each measure, if it's an anxiety or depression or IQ score, will have their own um, sort of cutoff scores that they found to be indicative of a clinical level impairment. Um, and those should be provided in the report. That's a really good question. So um, that's why these qualitative descriptors are helpful because the number might mean different things depending on the measure, like what you want to do with that. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Good question. Um, so <clears throat> The long and short is it depends on your insurance company in terms of whether or not you get reimbursement. Um, the, the, if, if it's done um, by a psychologist or neuropsychologist, um, then each visit um, is considered a medical visit, right? Uh, so they are um, uh, medical doctors, so yes, it would be um, it, there would be a, a relevant um, uh, intervention code, service code that would be associated with that. Yeah. But do you actually know anyone who's had it fully reimbursed? Like I know several people. And I don't know a single person who's ever gotten it reimbursed more than like the minimum amount. And this is where you know parents and um, providers can like really need to be advocating for our fellow human beings, right? That, um, you know, there's mental health parity in theory, right? But um, it's very easy for insurance providers to advocate for diabetes or cancer treatments, but mental health interventions um, oftentimes don't typically get the same level of coverage. What is the average cost for such an evaluation? Uh, uh, for a comprehensive psycho ed eval, um, um, so, <clears throat> again, it depends on the, the type and the scope, um, but it's on the order of several thousand. Yeah, f five to seven is typical. I think the most I've seen reimbursed is 20%, and that's in this great community. Can you do that better experience? Yeah. So you once mentioned Kaiser and already for them, but that's a picture of 
Um, yeah. Let's take one more question. If there are any last questions, I'm mindful of the time and I want to be respectful that you all have been a great audience and we're almost at the end. Adult testing. Now, the 16 and up. Mm -hmm. When do you think it should be done? I mean, just so, so students can get what they need in college and I mean, what's your norm here? Um, so, I mean, we see, we see the full spectrum. Um, I mean, our clinic is specifically for kids, teens, and young adults. Um, but if the question is really, you know, I want to make sure that my child has educational accommodations in a college setting, um, I would, and if you have concerns beginning, you know, in, say, late elementary school, then start your testing then. Um, the likelihood of you being able to successfully advocate for your student um, and for them to get accommodations for uh, college admissions tests or in uh, a university setting goes up when you have a paper trail. But also, you know, you can then also advocate for your student and make sure that the recommendations are all happening, they're all online, they're, you know, they're, uh, they're occurring. Um, and that's what sets your student up for success more than anything else, mm -hmm. rather than just getting, you know, extra time on tests, mm -hmm. right? Part of the process is, you know, helping your student to know their particular profile um, and for them to be able to successfully navigate the world, whether or not it's school, and whether or not it's friends or at home, how to navigate the world um, as best as they can. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. Um, my son, he was diagnosed with dyslexia in uh, kindergarten, actually, and then he's been in Charles Armstrong, and he's now fifth grade, so mm he's -hmm. doing great. But I never, because he has always had a high I never opened the IEP or 504. Was that a mistake? <laughs> do it Should now. I go and do it now? Okay. I wasn't sure, like, I mean, for, you know, later, um, how important that is for yeah. his records. From. And, and my understanding about um, Charles Armstrong is that um, they go until, I believe, eighth grade? Yeah. So you can, you know, participate in the process. It is required to test every child, even if they're at a private school. So even though they're at Charles Armstrong, they have to go. So then you just have a paper trail she's talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it can help once your kid gets to college because I do get a little bit suspicious sometimes of somebody showing up at college and is like, I think I have ADHD, so it's good to have some records there from prior, or, you know, any type of learning challenge. All right, um, so we will end um, now. So thank you so much for being here um, and for attending our, our talk today. 